I was very flattered to be asked to close this keynote, it's, it, to close the conference, because it's been a fabulous conference, and uh, Viv was saying thank you to the whole organising team, and I th I'm sure we'd kind of echo those thanks. So. So giving a closing t keynote is always a bit tricky because people keep mentioning the things that you're going to say in all of the talks and you're thinking, oh no, strike that, strike that. So I'm not left with many things to say that many of the other speakers have not already said uh, themselves. So I'm going to focus in on learning and what we've learned from the conference. So who here has learned something at Swansea Conference that they, they something new they didn't know about before? Right, there's loads of new stuff that we, we, we've heard about and want to read about and try out when we get back. Uh, here were a few things that um, I, I was thinking about. So there's um, things like uh, TDD has been talked about a lot and the rules for simple design, connaissance, listening to your types to improve flexibility, the evaluation cutter, not making classes public by default, uh, arch architecturally aligned tests, um, considering the user experience of your software design, uh, going to Socrates, uh, for example, the one that's happening in Belgium very soon, <laughs> <laughs> and um, making software craftsmanship, this is what Sandro started with, but making software craftsmanship your ideology um, and embarking on a search of better ways to do things. So these are kind of a whole bunch of new things to try. Now, when you get back to work, you may be expecting some amazing reception where people are like thrilled to hear everything that you've learned about. You know, they're kind of really going to be, but sadly, this is not actually what very often happens. So I know, like, I know it from my point of view. I'm going to get into work tomorrow, and uh, p people will have forgotten I've been away. And uh, they, they were like, weren't you here yesterday? I thought I saw you or something. And, and really, it's a kind of an anti-climax feeling as you get back to work. But if you are serious about following up on some of the things that you've learned about, you really probably do need to talk to people and get them interested in your ideas. But the thing is that they will all have different worries. And my experience is... Every single person has a different reason why you can't do things. It would be easy if they, there was like one reason and you resolve that reason. But it's like people are all different and they have different worries and anxieties. So, you know, you get people who are worried because they don't know how to do a thing. You get people who aren't sure we're allowed to do a thing. We're not sure if, um, if we do this new thing. Like, for example... We just had a talk about microservices. So um, but maybe that will wreck our whole product, you know, so that people are worried about things. And then there are always a, a small cluster of people at work who are just thinking, well, I've, I've got, I've just about know what I'm doing now. I don't want to do new things. I just want to be good at the things I'm already doing. And like that thing that you're talking about sounds like hard work. Do we really have time to learn new things? So... When you approach new, uh, new people, not new people, when you approach people at work about new ideas, just need to go carefully. And what can really help, and this is my number one tip for changing things in any organisation, is slow down. Organisation, and I know somebody said this today, organisational change is slow, and uh, it's much slower than you think. There's no rapid conversion overnight. It's just the hard work of like, well, now we've done this, and now we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this. And so don't have the expectation that it's all going to be magic, and you get back, and it's like, boom, by the end of next week, you've done the thing. It will take a lot longer for it to stick. And even when it seems like people are doing a thing, they kind of lapse back into their old ways as well. So it doesn't even... Uh, you think, oh yeah, success, we are now having coding dojos. And then after a few weeks, people don't go to the coding dojo. And it's like, ah. Uh, so don't have high expectations, but then also don't give up. So uh, the, when people react negatively, sometimes people are like, oh, no, I, don't, I can't say my idea anymore. I've said it once. I've given up. Um, you keep trying. 
And what can be really important to understand is to just understand why people are reacting in the way that they react. So try to think about putting yourself in their shoes. So you've been off on a jolly for two days. Uh, they have not been off on a jolly for two days. They have been doing things with less people at work. So they're possibly a bit tired and stressed. Um, and you probably haven't been reading all of your work emails, so you may not be up to speed. It's, so even you might get into work and spend the first little time trying to figure out what was going on. So you're not much help initially. So there are techniques. And in the panel yesterday, we talked about developing empathy for others. If you are struggling to think about how to do this, uh, there are actually techniques. So this is a technique uh, which is more a user experience technique, actually, where you try to think about a change from another person's perspective. Or in a, and it's called uh, empathy maps. You pick a role or a person. It, in, in this case, it might be a user. But if you think uh, you could pick your manager or you could pick another developer at work and think, OK, so what are they going to think about this idea? And uh, what are the kinds of things they're going to say? Uh, if you've worked with people for a long while, you pretty, you're actually very often quite good at thinking what a certain person will say and what a certain other person will say. And then you have to think about, well, how are you going to respond to those things? And I think that thinking that out a little bit in advance can help you to be more prepared and think about how uh, you explain something to somebody. So the other thing is, right, this is a, I tried to find a, a, foot, a, a Welsh rugby football crowd all excited, you know, they're all in support. The thing is, even if you did explain your idea, you are not ready. You have not invested much time in learning how to do the thing. So to some extent, you, you just because you heard an expert at test driven development say ex, uh, test driven development is very important and you need to learn how to do it, you're really going in there thinking, I'm not ready to teach people how to do this. I don't know how to do this. So the very first thing you need to do usually is sp spend some time, your time, learning, reading, so reading books, reading blogs, trying things out. Those are the kinds of things that will make you more of an authority on the topic or the thing that you're encouraging people to do. Uh, because they, un if they did trust that you're an expert, when you're not, you could be leading them into trouble. And so it's fair of you to spend more time thinking about how you could, um, uh, you know, whether this, this thing that you heard about is actually a good idea anyway. So I work as a coach, and one of the things that I really focus on as a coach is creating conditions for learning. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think those conditions for learning are. So, now where's Francie? Francie, you said if anybody had any questions at the end, <laughs> that they could ask them now. Now, I don't know if you do, but really, if you're going to drive any learning, you have to have questions and curiosity. You have to have things that you don't know about. So, questions are a really good start. One thing you could do when you get back from SwansiaCon is you could actually make a list of all the questions. The list of all the things that you still don't know uh, how you're going to solve. And you almost make like a backlog of questions. And then you can sort of say, well, what's the most important thing? Or do these have dependencies between them? Or what do I need to know first? Um, and so having a list of questions that are useful and valuable to solve is, is a good start for creating this kind of learning environment. The other thing, and that, like, I was really struggling to find a way to represent this, is what's the main reason why people don't do a lot of learning at work? Can you, can you think? Uh, laziness. <laughs> yeah, maybe t t time and, and possibly laziness. Uh, but mostly people feel, right, I'm at work. I'm employed to do a job of work, yeah? 
So I'm being paid to write more code, or I'm being paid to test code, or I'm being paid to write requirements. So it feels like the productive aspect of our work is the thing that we focus on the most. Um, but basically, you don't become, you can't stay good at a skill if you don't invest time in it and invest time in your skills. So you can't, and it is actually really hard to, um, to do all of the learning at home. So I, who has open source projects that they haven't contributed to for a while? Yeah, it's, it's like you start a thing and then you're, yes, I'm really, really going to do this. And then it, just everything gets busy at work. So when you get home, you're just like, oh, I, I'm just going to have to rest. I just want to watch TV or listen to music or go for a run. But you don't want to write code. Now, there will be some people who, and I know some people, some people on our team, right, they're, they're really well organized. And they have their, their week and their day structured. So they make time in their day. Like some people get up very early and they have time when they write code then. Some people write code late at night. Not looking at Sandra at all. <laughs> you are the, the, the night owl. Um, but the thing is, if it is valuable for a business to have uh, employees and developers who are good at the thing that they do, then it should be possible to create little bits of space in the work week when you invest in that at work. Okay, So where I work, we do do that, and there are a bunch of ways that we do it. Uh, and again, the, way, the secret to this is to do it slowly and in small bites. So you don't say, right, OK, so from now on, we're spending this amount of the week doing this learning. You kind of say, oh, well, we could have these coding dojos. And they'll only take, you know, like an hour once a week. Or we might have some lightning talks, and they might happen every month. And so it feels like little tiny bites of time. But gradually, that all adds up until you have a, an environment where learning is happening. So people do question this and say, well, what's the value? You know, I, I would just like to hire people who are good at things, and then they can learn in their own time. There is, has anybody read this book by Daniel Pink called Drive? So it's, um, so it's quite an easy read. It is a hard, well, this is a hardback. Maybe there's a paperback now by now. But it's very easy to read. There's also a very good 10-minute video that just summarizes it. So you don't have to read it, uh, which I recommend. Uh, the thing is that what he's trying to say or talk about in the book is that for people who are knowledge workers, basically, which is kind of like in the software industry, uh, the things that drive your motivation are connecting to a bigger purpose, so understanding that what I'm doing makes a difference in the world, the opportunity to improve my skills, so learning is kind of key to that, and also or autonomy, the, the opportunity to choose, have choices, be in control. So those three factors, you can work those into your kind of way that you do learning at work. So you want to make it attractive. Uh, sometimes this is by, oh, we're going to have a... a and we literally have had, been having this... There's a book club we've been having with the team leads... Uh, which has been every other week on a Friday, uh, but there is lunch provided. And providing lunch is some way of saying, but it's not just a hot... Well, because a lot of time when people provide lunch, they go for the lowest possible, oh, here is your pizza from wherever it is. Um, and it's not a very nice or healthy lunch, so we have a healthy lunch. And that makes people feel like, oh, they've made some care to make a nice thing for us. So, uh, but people need to understand that it's something that the organisation values in them is this learning, um, this learning, um, and taking an interest in your own personal development. So, the other thing is when you're trying to introduce an idea and. I've seen this happen a lot with technologies. People will hear about a technology at a conference. They'll spend an afternoon playing around with the technology. 
and they'll say, oh, here it is, and it's really horrible to use. It is worth, if you want to actually have more than you use a technology, uh, you can write some guidelines, you can have some uh, uh, examples, you can organise it well and give links to other references. That will help people to actually understand uh, what, how the tool that you're recommending can be used. This is, just in case you're wondering why there's these kids with penguins, this is, if you're learning to skate, you can get this like penguin thing, and then it's, it's a fun way for kids to learn to skate without just falling over, um, because they have a penguin, so they, and they can fight the penguins and stuff like that. So, so we had a talk yesterday <laughs> about lean and theory of constraints and bottlenecks, one of the things that if you are the person who organises everything, then you will become a bottleneck. So it's very important that you decrease dependency on you. If you're going to try and create an environment of learning at work, you, you do need to support it. You will need to do work in the background. But if you're the person who does absolutely everything, if you go on holiday or away to a conference, or it, everything will collapse. So what you really need to do is involve people and have a pe group of people who make things happen. So that, uh, and, and this can be really one of the hardest parts. When you involve other people, and maybe Viv had this with the uh, conference, then they have other ideas, and then there's, dis there's then, then everything expands, and then more things happen, and, it's, it's, and it, then suddenly it turns out the thing that you're, you're doing isn't what you originally thought it was. So this kind of thing will happen involving other people, but ultimately it will stick with people if ever there is more people involved. It's also true that there, you will not always get everyone on side, uh, but a key part of uh, not being the person that everyone depends on is to not have any secrets. So you have to make the process by which you do things very open and very obvious so people know. One of the things we have at work, for example, we have tech talks and every two weeks we have a different curator, because this is like a fashionable London word for organiser of a thing. So we have a different curator of the tech talks and there is a list on the wiki that says, right, okay, so if you're the curator, these are things that you could do, right? You have to check the things work in the meeting room. You have to ask people about what talks they might have, not just the day before it happens, but like a few weeks so they can actually prepare talks. And so there's a bunch of expertise. So often, if you are good at organising, one of the things you can do is you can write down, here are steps that I do, like, for example, if Viv was wanted to run another conference like this next year, um, it'd be really good to like ha recruit a co-chair and guide them in how to do it and write all the things down. Um, and then that would be a way to kind of pass on the knowledge and uh, the good learnings that you've had, if you see what I mean. So the other thing is, and um, it's often the case and I know, I know in where I work, there are people who will compl complain and uh, be negative. Uh, but actually, one of the things is they are actually talking to you. They are giving you information about what is useless about your idea, and you should be listening to them. So when people are grumbling about, oh, why is the coding dojo at 12 and it clashes with this other thing I'm doing, then listen to them. So, and actually think about whether we can change it, whether that's actually a serious problem that's making people not participate. That, so you don't kind of feel disappointed when... This is a natural thing. And it's actually worse when there's the opposite. So people criticising your idea is, is OK. It's when nobody notices. Like, so you have to develop interest in what you're doing. I mean, it's, it's disheartening if you try and run a thing at work about learning, and then no one shows up. So you have to do a little bit of advertising beforehand, and you have to get a few people on side, and you have to even talk to people at lunch time and say, will you come? And if you come, will you ask somebody else? So there'll be at least three of these, so that we, three people there, and then maybe we can do it again. So it's, it's worth trying to get people on side before um, things get going. So I 
did want to talk about some of the things that we do at work. I work at this company called Unruly. They're based in London. This picture is very squashed. They don't, they're not normally all that close together. That, but that, this is... Um, they're, they're just normal developers working in an environment where uh, they are trying to develop products. We have lots of live systems that we're maintaining and lots of customers wanting us to build more features. So we're in a normal environment. It's not like we're in some greenfield, idyllic world where you know, we've got oodles of time. Actually, everybody is very busy. And where we work, we have been using this technique, which is um, it's an, an approach to agile software development called extreme programming, or often shortened to XP. And we've been using this style of, of um, programming uh, since 2006, when we've been founded, so it's for a really long time. But XP has some excellent practices within it. I'm not going to talk all about XP, but I'm just going to talk about some of the practices that help you to learn. So, oh, no, I'd forgotten about this. So that we do have uh, a culture where learning is everywhere, such that um, Tim, one of the team leads, printed these fake banknotes called learnings and put a picture of the CTO on them. <laughs> so they're like, when I say we've got learning everywhere, I actually mean like Tim has scattered these learning papers everywhere. But um, uh, that this is not an essential step in uh, a learning plan. However, it does show that people are comfortable with the idea or uh, that they're at least aware that it's something we're trying to do. So when I was designing this talk, I did think, I, I like normal, low-tech tools. I don't design my talks in PowerPoint. So I went to a whiteboard and I drew this picture about all of the different sources of learning that you can find, because there are a lot in our, in our um, workplace. So, and I'm just going to go, so these are supposed to be people. I'm not a good artist either. Um, so these could be your teammates. You, your, the people you work with, know stuff and you can try and learn from them so don't always treat them as if they don't know anything um, and the techniques we use to do that and I'm going to talk a little bit about this is pair programming and mob programming you can also learn from other teams so you can switch to other development teams and you can also spend time with other parts of the organization and and you can even swap and go and work in another organisation, and I'll talk a little bit about that. A thing that people often forget is that you can learn from your live production systems. So by monitoring them, uh, you can see what's going on there over time, and that can t tell you something about how effective your systems are. And I know it says monkeys there, which you probably can't read. I'm not saying that you've got actual live monkeys. But you can, um, I think is it Netflix who have the chaos monkey? You can actually do testing in your live systems by replicating uh, bad behavior. So you can, we actually do some performance tests in our live systems. Um, and that, we actually have it set up on a regular basis so that we can make sure that we're, our performance is always working. You can also, learn from your users and doing user research and then there's the more classic areas of learning so you can learn from going to meetups and conferences so you already know about conferences you're here um, but hopefully I know there are local meetups around here so look for a meetup in your area and go to it and that helps you to kind of keep up with the energy for learning and then there are a ton of things like I know there's a ton of people in the audience, actually, who've written books. Can the people who've written books raise a hand? See, there's a few people who've written books. You could read their books. Uh, and who's got a blog? Have people got blogs? Lots of people got blogs. Yeah, so there's lots of sources. Uh, there's lots of sources. And open source projects we already touched on. There's lots of resources that you can just do solo learning on. But what you often want to do is to try and... Uh, what I'm trying to recommend, really, is that you try to use as many sources as you can of the different kind of learning. So here's, this is one of the core practices of extreme programming. It's called pair programming. 
And what it involves, and what we do, is that all our production code is written by a pair of developers. Not, we don't have any production code that's done by a person on their own. And the way that we organise that is we're in small teams of four to five people, and we swap pairs every day. So we'll have uh, something that we're working on. So this is Benji and Jell. So if Benji and Jell worked on a thing this morning, then tomorrow morning, one of them is going to swap out and somebody else is going to swap in. This means that everybody in the team cycles through all of the different work. Another technique that we use uh, is called is mob programming, and that's where we have more than two people involved. And sometimes this is the whole team, but more often for us, it's like, it's like a mini mob, so it's like three to four people. So this is one person from three different teams working on some shared infrastructure together. So the idea is we want each team to have somebody who knows how the shared infrastructure works, so we get them all to work together. Uh, idea, when you look at photographs that you've taken, you suddenly realise there's something missing. So normally we have a massive monitor, which makes it much easier for people to see, uh, and this is a picture of them not using a massive monitor. <laughs> um, and a, a core technique, which is not an XP practice, it's more of an agile software development practice, is retrospectives. So who here has been already trying retrospectives? So that it's a very common agile technique, and it involves basically every few weeks sitting down together as a team and talking about what you've learned. Now we try to think about, we're often, we often have a lot of experiments that we're trying to do, to do within, in our process, and so we're reviewing how those things are going. And we're often tinkering with our process. I wanted to draw your attention to a few things in the picture, just because if I don't tell you, you won't know. Um, so we had a talk about remote te teams. So there is actually somebody in New York in this picture, and they're there. They're in the laptop, but they're sitting around the table. And um, what we do is Amy puts her notes into the chat, and we put them onto post-it notes, and we put them on the wall, and we take photographs, and we send her the photographs of our notes, and we try to make her feel like she's part of the group around the table. Um, other things we do, we take turns for people to run the retrospectives, and it's usually somebody from outside your team. So if our teams are all named after some different kinds of pickles, so, um, we, so somebody from Marmalade will facilitate the Chutney retrospective, and somebody from Chutney will facilitate the Tabasco retrospective. And there's a big wiki page with a big list so people know who's done it most recently. And that means we get a variety in how the retrospective is not always the same. It kind of creates a variety. But also, another thing I want to point out in the picture is, well, have, for those of you who have been in, in a retrospective, is there anyone who's been in there and you think, I really can't remember what's happened recently? Yeah? Okay, so this happens a lot for us. In fact, maybe, you know, if we're having a retrospective and it's on Thursday, nobody can remember what they were working on on Monday or like the week before. So what we do is we um, keep a little diary. It's like a sort of timeline on our whiteboard, and we, uh, we write on it every day at the stand-up. And we have a photograph of that, and we print it off in the retrospective. But we also send it to Amy, so Amy can see what we've been up to, and that helps her to kind of remember as well. And I might come back to this. That's that mysterious piece of paper there. Um, what else can I say? OK. All right, so then we do more classic things, coding dojos. Actually, the technique for coding dojos is very similar to mob programming, where different people take turns to be the person driving at the keyboard. And what we do is we have different developers will volunteer to run a, like a mini-series of dojos. So you're not committing to do it for the next year. You're normally saying, I will run three dojos on ES6, or I will run three dojos on Elixir, or Ruby, or something. So it's not a massive commitment. And then we always make them at the same time, every week. And what we do is it's a time where it's close to lunchtime, so people feel like it's an OK point to break in the day. Uh, and we even 
in our offices, we actually have a co-working space where other companies are working, and we invite them in to come and join our coding dojos if they want. We also have tech talks, and so I kind of, I've been talking about learning together up to now, but what I want to talk also, it's very important to, if you are learning together, a good thing to do is to make sure there's an opportunity to share learning as well. So uh, we have lightning talks where pe people will give a short talk. This is one of the things that you could do when you get back to work, is you could say, well, I'll give you a talk about all the things that I learned at SwansiaCon. And we have another thing, another thing we do, and this is like when I'm talking about where I work, I'm thinking this is the thing that's probably hardest for other people to implement. We are very lucky in that we work in a company where we have one day a week to do learning time. So we have real 20% time. Everybody gets a day a week when they can do that. And uh, on Friday, we do a sharing session where we share what we've been learning. So this is... Oh, we have this Viking helmet that is our talking token. This is an unimportant part of it, but it's something that creates... Uh, you can't be too serious about what you've been learning when you're wearing a Viking helmet, especially now, because it's only got one horn. I mean, it's had one horn for about the last year, and people like put it on with like, the horn sticking out here or <laughs> stuff. Anyway, the, the point being, even if you didn't have that 20% learning time, making a time when you talk about what you've been learning recently, like articles I've read or something, even if, and just everybody sharing something small, this creates this environment that it's okay to invest in my career and learn about things, and other people do it too. And what you'll find is that, that actually what other people have learning, been learning about sparks interest, and people go, oh, I'm interested in that. Maybe you can show me, and then I'll, maybe I will do it myself. So it's, it's important. A lot of developers sit away from business people. Are you in a situation where you're like this? You're all with your business people or far away? Yeah, we, we are in, in, it seems always true that we're on the lower floor. Like, we're not quite in the basement, but we're, everybody's upstairs and we're downstairs. Um, but what we do is we have er, one person from each team goes to sit upstairs every day. So we have a group of us who sit upstairs. And they're, they're interruptible for, from, by anybody in the business to discuss new stories and support requests and that kind of stuff. Um, we also have, because I was explaining about this co-working space, there is actually a company who make videos. And so sometimes we have strange people in our office. And this is literally gel being very surprised that there were th these people dressed up as uh, Starship Troopers. And so she's... Uh, asked if she could pose with them, but it's, what I wanted to, to have this picture to explain is we actually do a thing which I think many organisations could do, is we swap teams. So all our developers, every three months they get asked, would you like to work in another team? And it can be like now, in six months or never, and then if you were going to move into another team, which team would it be? And so we just do that survey every three months. And then what we try and do is, is try and move people around, but very slowly, so they get to work on different parts of the code base. And also, even if... And we do have some guys who've never moved team, but the thing is, their team has moved. So basically, they didn't... They still sit in the same corner of the office, and they uh, still work mainly on the same product, but they now have different people in their team. So they learn from those new people, especially because we do this pair programming. The other thing that we've tried to do uh, is to do swaps between organisations. This would seem to be uh, quite hard to set up. It's actually not that hard. We heard about it from a company called Seven Digital, so that we said, oh, well, we'll try and do it with you first. And then we told some other companies, and they wanted to do it as well. And so we've done it now for... This is the third year we're doing developer exchanges for. The way we do it is one person, one developer, goes for a week to the other organisation and they see how they do their practices. We do pick companies that we think have got good practices we'd like to learn from. Um, so it, it, there have been a few people who've said, we'd like to do a dev exchange with you and we've gone, ah, well, maybe we don't want to learn about PHP or something like that. So, uh, 
And so this person here, this is Tom, he works at a company called Tim Group, and he's spending a week working with us. And at the end of the week, he did a little presentation about what he'd learned from us. And then he went back to where he works and did a presentation to them about all the strange things we do. And then we are going to set up a return visit, which I still need to organise. Um, but we've done it with other companies. So that's a bunch of different ideas of way, ways that you can learn from other people. There are a few things that I wanted to say about what makes it stick within our, our organisation. So this is really the most important thing. Uh, and it's kind of a cute picture of Arbor and Alex doing a heart shape. But you have to care that things happen. If nobody cares, learning, and, uh, learning within your organisation quickly dies out. You have to say, oh, is nobody going to the Code Dojo today? <coughs> or um, if there don't seem to be many volunteers for a tech talk, it's like, oh, I suppose I could do a tech talk. Uh, it, it, you, you need to care about it still being alive and create that momentum, really. So take part and take interest. You don't have to run everything, but participate in it. And then the other thing, which I talked about before, is taking turns. So we do, we do take turns. Um, I don't mean like this. This was just we had a fire alarm. Our assembly point is in a kid's playground, so we were all outside. This is not the actual Silicon Milk roundabout. So that's Silicon roundabout. But anyway, the thing is that if it's not just down to one person to make things happen, things keep going more. And actually they are more, you have better ideas uh, because you have a diverse group of people who will think about doing things differently. And th the last thing, and this seems like a weird thing to talk about, but it's actually numbers matter. I think uh, there was a talk where we, actually gathering data is a useful thing to do. This is, how, this is how one of our teams collects data about how they spend their time and where the time goes. Each team has a, a bit of whiteboard that they use to track what's the kind of work that they're doing. And so I will explain this because they call this hieroglyphics, and it is a bit hieroglyphics, but this star shape is like I had my 20% time. This downward stroke is I was working upstairs with the business teams. These circles with two dots, I was pairing on a feature. So we can see who's paired with who from this. And then the, this is kind of supposed to be a hammer and nails. This is our improving our, working on our technical debt kind of things. And then there are a few other symbols in there, like there's this pyramid of people. This is a day full of meetings. Uh, this is the person who's currently the team lead of that team, and you can see that they had three days of meetings when nobody else did. This kind of thing is research, so researching new features. So the symbols, it doesn't matter. They can be the symbols that suit your team. It's, it represents the type of work that you do. But what you can then do is you can photograph them, print them out, and you can use them in your retrospective. And you say, well, do you think we really should be spending so much time doing meetings or whatever it is? So uh, there are th just those very simple tools that we use that help us to keep this learning effort going. So I'm going to stop talking about Unruly and where I work, and I come back to like, being in Wales and being on a lovely evening. So this is uh, over by Rosselli and looking out to Worm's Head, which I went on Sunday evening. And I want you to think about it as the as the sun sets on Swansea Comfort, I want you to think about uh, what you want to take back. Um, for instance, you could get a cute Welsh dragon or something. But I'd, I really think that try not to be too intimidating and fierce as a dragon when you go back to work. Try to think about how you can be friendly and actually put some effort into sharing things with the people who didn't get to go to the conference. So. Here are a few things you could do. You could look for some opportunities to help people learn about things that you already ha know about. You could um, invest some of your own time in learning about something that you learned about here. 
And you could share what you've learned by writing a blog post or, or doing a talk, or you know, maybe doing a talk at a meetup that you have locally, so that you are spreading that knowledge more widely. So um, with those closing thoughts, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you to the organisers of, of SwansiaConf. And uh, that's, those are my details, um, so thank you.